John chapter 11. John chapter 11, verses 17 through 27. John 11, 17 through 27. Now when Jesus came, he found Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha, therefore when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary stayed seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise in the resurrection in the last day. Jesus said to her, in the greatest passages you'll ever hear, maybe they'll preach it at your funeral, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever's believing in me even though he may die, he will live. And everyone who is living and believing in me will never die, cannot die, has not the ability to die unto eternity. Do you believe this? She said, yes, Lord. I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Father, we ask that you'll bless the truth of your word this day, and you will bring it to bear upon our hearts and minds. For those in this room who remain spiritually dead, that today they would be believing and have life. And Lord, for those who are alive and are believing, I pray that they would have a much higher view of you and would glory in you for who you are, for what you do, and that they would worship and follow you all the rest of the days of their life. Pray these things by your spirit, in Christ's name. And God's people said, Amen. So last week, we were made aware of the condition of the sinner. Right? We have a sevenfold description of what the sin sinner looks like. Well, this week, we're going to be made aware of the impeccability of Christ. So last week, we looked at this sinner. This is how he's described. He's biblically joyless. He's sick, sick, sick. He's destitute. He's blind. He's impotent. He's mortal. He is dead. We look at all these descriptions this week, we're going to find that Christ has an answer for every failure of humanity. You're going to be able to see how every seven description of the sinner, Jesus has an answer for each one of those descriptions. And that way, we can glory in Christ for how he is able to deal with man's greatest problem. Now, if you want it in a theological jargon, one of the glorious benefits of having a proper anthropology, you have a proper understanding of man, is that it will reveal a breathtaking Christology. Right. You understand man rightly, then you'll be amazed at Christ and who he is. Now here's the danger in churches today. Those who make men look good, you know, try to make him look all right, try to make men look good, they see a very small glimpse of the beauty and the glory of Christ. 
So let's just paint the picture as the Bible paints the picture. Let's show man to be depraved, and that way we can see the great glory of the grace of Christ. Now, what happens in these passages, this is alluded to in Charles Brown's book that we'll be studying tonight, but we see the grace of a passage. It's, it's a gracious thing to see that life can be had after death, that there is life on the other side. That's very gracious, and we're happy about that. But sometimes we miss the glory of the passage. Here's the glory. God came down in human flesh and has the power to raise the dead and reveals his deity before all those around that we make glory that God would come down and give life to the dead. It's an amazing thought. So we have before us Jesus in human flesh demonstrating resurrection power over physical humanity and the implication is he does the same for the spiritual aspect of humanity if you want a thesis statement that's nice and short it would be this every flaw of human nature is redeemable by the great i am every flaw of human nature think about all your flaws just how messed up are you you think about your thoughts, your speech, all of your life, all of the flaws. Preacher, you don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. Okay, fine. But every flaw that you have, every flaw that I have is redeemable by the great I am. So we cast our attention upon him and look to him this morning. Now, in the beginning of this message, it's very, very basic. And I, I hope that you'll see some of the basic things that just happen in the life of humanity. In verse 17, he found, he found Lazarus already dead in the tomb four days off. So I just relate to you the distance to just to show you what's going on. Not creating anything new, but just setting the stage for you in verse 17. It reads, now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. You'll remember at the end of John 10, Jesus traveled 20 to 25 miles to go across the Jordan, probably over at Bethabara where he's first baptized. It's 20, 25 miles by foot. It's going to be a two-day journey. So he's traveled over there. It took two days for the messenger, Mary and Martha, send a message to Jesus. It takes two days for them to travel over to the other side of the Jordan to tell Jesus. Jesus remains there for two days and waits. You remember that at the beginning of the passage. And then he comes back. That takes him two days. We've got six total days. Two days over, two days waiting, and then two days to travel back. During this process of time that Jesus is in sovereign control of, knows all that's happening, what's going on with Mary and Martha? I just want you to get the taste of just basic human life. For two days, a messenger's gone out. We don't have Twitter. We don't have Facebook. We don't have instant message. We don't have all of this stuff. You have to walk the message 20-something miles. You have to wait for the return 20-something miles. And so when the messenger leaves, they have no idea what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. What do they deal with? They watch. She watches her brother die. He's near unto death. He's at the, the text says, the point of death. They understand what it means to be in a room and watch a loved one die. I just want you to grasp, we're dealing with two women with broken hearts. We're dealing with emotion. We're dealing with tears coming down the face. We're dealing, you know what it's like when you lose a loved one, you have a hard time sleeping. It's awkward and, and you have a hard time going in that room because that's the room they died in. And I don't really want to go in that room anymore. And all of those things are going on with these two ladies in this story. And also I want to relate to you just the clarity of Jesus for the situation. Look again at verse 17. He found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Don't try to mess the story up. Lazarus is not in a coma. They don't bury people that are in a coma. It's not what you do. You bury people when they're dead. He doesn't pass. He's not moved on. He's not in a better place. Those type of phrases. He has not fainted. Lazarus really died. He stopped breathing. His heart's not beating. Blood's not flowing through his body no more. He's dead. 
His body has grown cold, and they have taken him. They have wrapped him. They have put him in the sepulcher. They put a stone over it, and they have left him in the graveyard because he is dead. You glance back up in your text to chapter 11, verse 14. Lazarus te uh, Jesus tells them plainly, Lazarus has died. That's the truth. That's the fact. And let that resonate with you. That same statement is going to happen to everyone in this room. One day it will be said of you, they are dead. Life will come to an end. For every one of us, no matter what your belief system is, we have to grapple with the reality that one day we will no longer be here. And I would say to you by implication that everything that can be said about the physically dead must be applied to the physical, the spiritual condition of humanity. Whatever implications you can make, can dead men respond? Can dead men get up? Can dead men use their free will? Can dead men do anything? You're like, no, they can't. That's the spiritual condition. They're dead. They cannot respond to anything. Something has to happen to them in order for them to respond. Lazarus is not coming out of the tomb. He's not making a decision. He's not being swooned by music. I don't care what the lighting is that day. I don't care if the sun comes up all pretty or if it's behind the clouds. Lazarus is not moving unless something's done to him. That's the condition. That's where we are. We preach the gospel. We read the Bible. Why? Because we believe through it that God would do something to a dead spiritual sinner. And unless he does, they will remain dead, no matter how witty you may be in your presentation. So I would say to you this, although the distance, as we've looked, we've understood the situation is that he is dead. But I would also remind you about deliverance. All hope for life is in another. Just face the reality this morning. Every hope you have of spiritual life lays outside of you. And so for the Christian, you say, well, what am I supposed to do with that information? Every family member, every neighbor, and every co-worker that you have that is lost, hope lies outside of them. So you say, I don't know why they do this. I don't know why they say this. I don't know why they won't come to church. I don't know why they won't live like this. They're dead. They have no spiritual life. The only way their situation is going to change is if there's divine stimuli applied to their hearts. Well, how that's going to happen? I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to share the gospel with them. I'm going to serve them. And by the great goodness of God, by grace, perhaps he might open their eyes. And when he does, they'll see the beauty of Christ and they'll never be the same. Do you believe this? The only hope for the Democratic Party is the gospel. I'm going to get political. The only hope for the Republican Party is the gospel. The only hope for abolition is the gospel. The only hope for drunkenness is the gospel. The only hope for drugs is the gospel. The only, the only uh, solution for your pride-filled, selfish neighbor is the gospel. The only hope for your co-worker who is distant from you and won't talk about spiritual things, the only hope is the gospel. You only have one bullet, Barney. Just keep shooting that one. Even if you shoot yourself in the foot, just keep shooting the right bullet. Amen. I said it Wednesday night. Now, we have church on Wednesday, in case you didn't know. But anyways, that's another story. Walter Percy said this about the unbeliever. And I want to say it again because it fits this dead scenario. Walter Percy, an American author, I don't think he was converted, but that's my opinion. He says this. The present day unbeliever is crazy. The present day unbeliever is crazy because he finds himself born into a world of endless wonders and he has no notion how he got here. A world in which he eats, he sleeps, he works, he grows old. He gets sick and he dies. He takes his comfort and ease. He plays along with the game. He watches TV. He drinks his drink. He laughs. For all the world, 
as if his prostate were not growing cancerous, his arteries turning to chalk, his brain cells dying by the millions, as if the worms were not going to have him in no time at all. The unbeliever is crazy. He's living as if this stuff's not going to happen. He's living as if he's not going to die, as if the worms are not going to have him. He's living like he doesn't have prostate cancer. He's living as if somehow it's all going to work out and it's going to be better and better in this pie beyond the sky. He don't realize that one day he's going to be dead in eternity. 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 What's he going to do with eternity? Spiritual death leads to physical death. And that unto eternity. And I remind every lost person here and every lost person within the world. When Jesus finds you, he will find that you've already been dead. And he must speak a word in order for you to come to life. Now, that's 17. Secondly, we have a funeral on our hands. Verses 18 and 19, we have a funeral. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Now, just again, this is basic. I'm not trying to be creative here. But I do want you to notice the basic operation of a funeral, because we all have to face them, whether we like to or not. Now, <clears throat> Especially verse 19, look, many of the Jews had come to Martha and to Mary. There, there's this grief. They have come to console. A group of people meet at a house where a family has lost a loved one to console them. This stuff's been going on ever since humanity's been around. It's right. It's good. I have a loved one die. Come console us. Pray for us. Spend time with us. We do the same for you. There's a sense in which there needs to be consolation, comfort, and encouragement. Let me give you this word again. Later on in John 11, 31, same chapter, when the Jews were, who were with her in the house, consoling her. It's a, it's a proper ministry. Console people when they lose a loved one. You say stuff like, I'm sorry to hear of your loss. Is there anything that I can do for you? Or better yet, you say, if I was in their shoes, this is what I want. And you just do it for them. You just take them some food. You go by and pray with them. Or you just walk in their house and you say, I just come by to give you a hug. You console them. That's what we do when someone dies. Another way the word is translated, they translate this console word, encourage. Encourage. Console encouragement. Let me uh, help you a little bit further with this. It's right and good to console or to encourage people when they go through grief. It's good for friends and family together and to work through the death of a loved one. And I would remind you, food is good. When you have a loss of a loved one, who wants to cook in the kitchen, right? But if you have a church family that loves you and they bring food by for three or four days, that's a ministry. And you welcome it, and you're happy somebody brought you food. And at least when all the family come in, there's food all over, and everybody can just eat, and you're not having to do all of that because you're grieving. It's right and good. Church, I know we got street preachers. I know we got abortion ministry. I know we got all kinds of glamorous things going on. But when somebody dies, I want somebody that can cook. I want somebody who can console and comfort me. We need everybody in the body of Christ to use their gifts. Amen. It's not only food, but I would love to receive a card, wouldn't you? In a time when you're sitting there weeping and you open a card and it says, we've been praying for you, we love you, and we care about you. And maybe you have a Bible verse and you start weeping and you go, man, my church loves me. You see, they, could, they gather together to console and to comfort them. That's right and good. And I would say to you, time is valuable. You ever been at one of those funerals? And you're off in the middle of nowhere and somebody comes driving up that you didn't think was coming. You don't even have to say anything. You're just like, wow. You think in your mind, they drove three hours one way to turn around and drive three hours back. Man, I love my church. It's just time. You know, they didn't give no money. They didn't give no food. They just showed up. These things matter. 
You go to a visitation. You go to a funeral. And you're there. And the family looks around and you're like, man, I'm so glad these people took time out of their day. We console one another. We encourage one another. We love one another. That's what church families do. And we as a church ought to do it well. That's what they're doing in this passage. But I would offer you a little bit more upon that. You want to really console? You want to really comfort somebody? Why don't you point them to Jesus? Amen. Yeah. Jesus is coming. This death's not the end. Things are not over. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. It's what happens in this passage. I know what happens because Martha hears that Jesus is coming. All this grieving is right and good. Nothing wrong with grieving. You ought to grieve the loss of a loved one. But if Jesus is coming, my grief is changing. I said, you know what? I think I need to go outside. What are you going outside for? I think I heard Jesus is coming. Yeah. I, I want to go talk to him. He says she went to meet with him. So Martha has this news come, and she moves out to meet with him. Let me, let me put it in. You want me to meddle as a pastor? I'll meddle a little bit. If Jesus is proclaimed at the church house and your family member dies on Saturday, I suggest you meet with Jesus on Sunday. Amen. Yeah. Oh, well, I can't come to church for three weeks. Somebody died. Somebody died. Where else are you going to go? Right. You need to hear from Jesus. You need to be with him as soon as you can be where his words of life are preached. Now, if you've got a dead beats dumb pastor that won't preach the Bible, I don't blame you. But if you've got a church that meets and tells you about Christ and unfolds the beauty of Christ, then go there and meet with him because that's the one who can comfort your soul. Yeah. That's the one who can minister unto you. Now, they do this, so I encourage you in all of those things and to point them to the gospel, to point them to Christ. What great encouragement. I have a loved one die in my family. You just come by and read Psalm 46, and I'll just go to sleep and have a good night. You just come on by, read a passage like that, I'll be okay. That's fine. They may do it at all kind of funerals. You want to come to the house and read Psalm 23 to me? I'll listen. To point me to Jesus and tell me that somebody will lead me through the valley of the shadow of death, and I'll believe that. Give me a word. Give me something I can hang on to. Point me to Christ, and may I do the same for you when you lose one that's in your family, that I would come and remind you of the glorious truth of Christ. All right, moving on to the issue of faith. Look at verses 20 through 22, 24 and 27, and let's deal a little bit with Martha. Look at Martha in verse 20. Look at her faith as we work this out. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming... She went and met him. Now the text brings this out, I think, for a purpose. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, she went out to meet him. She says to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I know you can take it positive or you can take it negative. I'm taking it positive. I think she has a high view of Christ. I think that because of the other passages in this section. And she's saying, this is what I know about you. If you were here, you could prevent death because of who you are. She said, if you would have been here, you could have made death stop. She has that type of view of Christ. And then scan down to verse 24. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And then look at verse 27. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ the Son of God who is coming into the world. Let me give you, uh, break this down this way. Convene, get together with someone to meet, to go to meet. It's like, think about some of these meetings with this same Greek word. So in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 8, there's this guy uh, on the other side in the country of the Gadareans. He was a demon-possessed man. This demon-possessed man, using this same word, went to meet Jesus. Demon-possessed, ate up with all of the world. What counsel do I have for you? Why don't you go meet with Jesus? Right. Or you can take another passage. You can take Luke 17. And there's these ten lepers. And these ten lepers went to meet with Jesus. Yeah. So if you're a leper, 
or you're demon possessed, or you're prideful, or you're selfish, or you're an idolater, or you're a liar, or you're a thief, or you're an adulterer, or you're a coveter, all of whatever it is that you are, my counsel, come quickly and meet with Jesus. Run directly to him. Grab a hold of him and don't let him go. Meet with Jesus and learn of him. Seek Christ. Sit at his feet regularly. Soak in his word. Get everything that Christ has to offer and take it as valuable treasure. Hang on every word. Get a picture of those angels and Peter leaning over, stooping to look into these things. Be like that with your condition. Go to Christ and take him at face value that whatever he says is true. Now, most of the time that we bring up Martha, at least at my house, it's always a joke about my wife. We bring it up, and in churches we do this. We always say, don't be like Martha. She's always busy in the kitchen. She's always serving and doing all these things. And she misses out. Mary's in there sitting at Jesus' feet. And in Luke, in, uh, in Luke chapter 10, she gets it right. She's in there at Jesus' feet. She's learning of him. And Martha missed out on that one-on-one -on -one intimate meeting with Christ and this personal conversation. You with me? I never noticed this before. Martha got it. Next scene after the fact, John 11. Who stayed in the house? Mary. Who went to be with Jesus? Martha. She's like, I'm not doing that again. And here in John 11, she gets to hear one of the glorious truths of the word of God that we cherish and love. She gets to hear it firsthand. And everybody else gets it secondhand. Man, don't miss those first-hand truths. You see, because in a sense, it's your loss. And I'd ask you this question, just honestly. Is it good to know that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life? Is that a good thought? Yeah. She got to hear it because she was there. Yeah. Well, everybody else is secondary. You want me to meddle as a pastor? That Wednesday night, we learned how to build a good name. Most of you don't know how. Why? Because you weren't here. Right. So there's glorious truth unfolded on Sundays, on Wednesdays. These truths come out. It's like so many times you don't get the advantage of them because you won't leave the house to meet with Jesus. Yeah. Right? It's like, I know there's work and I know Wednesdays now it's not required and that's not my point. My point is this. What is it that you're gaining somewhere else that, you're, that is more important or more satisfying than what you can get from Christ as he's unfolded in Scripture? My fear as a pastor is this, that many people miss out on the glorious truths that Jesus would teach just because they're watching TV. Just because they're hanging out in their yard weeding or something like that. And it's frivolous in their time away. And it's like, well, I just don't have time to go. And it's not true. And my, I, my heart breaks wide. So I'm like, it's your loss. Yeah. It's your loss. These things are being unfolded. And you're not taking advantage of them. And I encourage you. I'm not condemning you. I encourage you. Take every opportunity you get to meet with Jesus. Because this next time that the word's unfolded, it might be just exactly what you need. Bless your heart. Strengthen you. Man, don't miss out on anything that Christ has to offer to you. I could also say, so she convened. She met with Jesus. Don't miss that. Meet with him as often as you can. She becomes convinced when she meets with him. Look at what she's convinced of. These are thoughts that I have here. She's convinced of his ability. Right. If you've been here, my brother wouldn't die. Okay? She's convinced that he's able. She's also fully convinced of his deity. Yeah. Whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. I know there's no break in this relationship. Y'all are one. So whatever you ask is going to happen. So she's fully convinced of his deity. And because she's convinced of his ability... And because she's convinced of his deity, her faith is fulfilled. It's resolved. It's established. She's believing him for the right thing, for who he is. Now, you meet, you're convinced, and then you make a confession. Right? 
It's just straight from the text. Here's the confession. I know and I believe. She says in the passage, she says, I know, my brother, will rise again in the resurrection. I know that. Because I know who you are and I know that what you say is true, then I believe. What does she believe? I believe you're the Christ. I believe you're the son of the living God. Look at how this works. Meeting with Jesus gives you a resolve over theological truths and you conclude with a confession that says you're the Christ. How many times all of your life have you heard, man, you remember Peter's confession, on this rock I will build my church. Everybody knows that. What about this confession? How about a woman teaching us this morning from this text? Here's a confession. I know you're the Christ. Yeah. What a glorious thought. Would you come to that yourself today? Would you come to the point of believing and confessing Christ, what you believe about him? Now, if you want it in simpler question form, would you meet Jesus today? Tomorrow, the rest of eternity. Are you convinced that Jesus is who he claimed to be? Right practice, right knowledge is orthodoxy. Right knowledge is orthodoxy. Right practice is orthopraxy. When you have right knowledge, it will result in right practice. I know who you are, so I believe this about you, so I will publicly confess this before the whole world. That's the way it works. Now, we get to the facts of this passage. Fourth point is the fact. Verse 23, verse 25, verse 26. Look at the facts. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. It's just a fact. That's what's going to happen. Jesus states that fact. Why? Because he is the prophet. And he says he will rise. And then look at verse 25. Here's the fact. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. It's a fact. Everyone believing in him will live eternally with him. And then a third fact, verse 26. Everyone living and believing in me, it never, it's not possible to die and that unto eternity. And then that rhetorical question is hanging over us. I pray you take it home with you. Do you individually believe this. Not your grandmother, not your dad, your mom, not your cousin, not your pastor. Do you believe it? Do you believe these things about Christ? Is he this real unto you? Now, when Jesus makes a declaration that Lazarus will rise, he's making a prophetic future utterance. This is what's going to happen in the future. Turn very quickly to Deuteronomy 18. Let me just remind you of the text. Deuteronomy 18. A lot of quacks. False prophets running around today, but Jesus is no quack. He's no false prophet. Deuteronomy 18, 15 says this. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, whom your brothers... From your brothers, it is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Oreb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet, like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth. He will speak to them all that I command him. Whatever and whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of the other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. Jesus speaks. He will rise. By the time we get to the end of the chapter, we're going to have a dead man walking out of the tomb. Right. You should fear him. Yeah. Now, if the Lazarus doesn't come out of the tomb, you don't have to fear him. But because what he prophesies comes true, then we'd have a healthy fear of this prophet who's among us in this passage. Amen. Now, 
This prophet makes a pronouncement. Let me do this. In school, a long time ago, they give you a test, and they do a matching test. And so on one column, you have seven points, and on another column, you have seven points. And you match. This one goes to this one, this one goes to this, and you draw lines. Anybody remember this? Oh, yeah. Okay. Let me give you a matching test, if you will. What we have is we have people who are destitute, they're blind, they're impotent, they're sick, they're dead, they're mortal, and they're joyless. That's the sevenfold description of the sinner, right? Remember that from last week. Yep. Well, there are seven great statements in the Gospel of John. They're the I am statements concerning Christ. And as we look at those I am statements, we find what? We find he says, I am the bread. I am the light. I am the door. I am the shepherd. I am the resurrection. I am the way. I am the vine. So we match the condition of the sinner with the reality of who the person of Christ is. It says, it says the sinner is destitute. Jesus is the bread of life, and he'll feed you forever. The sinner is blind. I would tell you that Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And so for the blind man, he can give him sight and the light can shine. The, the man who is the sinner is impotent. Jesus is the door. He makes the opening possible. He opens the door to eternal life. The sinner is sick. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd knows how to take care of the sick and minister to them in their time of need. The sinner is dead. Jesus says, well, that's all right. I'm the resurrection and the life. The sinner is mortal. He won't live forever. Jesus says, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. That's the answer the sinner needs. The sinner is biblically joyless. And I told you wine is symbolic of joy. And I would tell you that when we get to John 15, Jesus is going to say, I'm the vine. This is where the joy comes from. I'm the source. Every flaw of the sinner is answered in the person of Christ because he is. Whatever you have, whatever the condition of your heart, wherever you've been, you say, well, I'm so bad I can't be saved. No, no, no. Jesus answers every flaw of the sinner. Every one of them. Amen. It's a prophet makes that pronouncement to us this morning and he gives us a great promise to close with. Dear believer, you're going to physically die, but you will live. Yeah. Amen. You will live. It's a bold declaration in this text. Everyone living, every one of you that's living, every one of you that's believing in Christ, do you see the do you see the, the universal scope and the narrowness? Everyone in the whole world living, everyone in the whole world believing, very, very wide, but very narrow in Christ. Not in anybody else, not in anything else. Everyone living and believing in Christ. You will not die unto eternity. There never, death will never be the last say upon your life. Oh, I love Greek grammar. Blessed be the double negative in Greek for the rest of my life. No, no way, not anyhow. It's never, ever going to happen. It's an absolute impossibility that you will die because if you're living and believing, you will live unto eternity. Amen. If you want it another way, it is grammatically, theologically, and doctrinally impossible for the Christian to die. Right. But just to hurt our brains, John eleven four says... This is not unto death. And then later in John eleven fourteen, 14, he says, Lazarus is dead. This is not unto death. Lazarus is dead. How, how in the, what do I do? I just read this story and I come to this conclusion. Physical death is not the finality for the believer. Right. Right. He proves that by raising him from the dead. But a point I left out two or three weeks ago, I'm bringing it in now. Although the seventh sign is the climax, Lazarus coming forth from the dead, can I give you a superlative climax this morning? As awesome as this is, that God raising the dead in human flesh, Jesus speaking life and being the resurrection of life, as, as awesome as this is, there's something that is a superlative. You know what it is? Jesus raises himself from the dead. 
You know, he calls himself out of the tomb. Yeah. And everyone who repents and believes in him has everlasting life. Not worried about physical death. I know it does not have the final say. It begs the question, does it not? You look in your text, you look at the end of verse 26, it must beg the question because the question is given by Jesus. Do you believe this? It's like the old argument for apologetics and the guy says, what about the innocent pygmy over in Africa? Does he go to heaven or hell when he dies? And so you get in all this discussion about the innocent pygmy over there in Africa. And I respond like this. I think R.C. Sproul might have said it, somebody else, but I respond this way. Are you a pygmy? Well, no. Do you believe? That's what matters. I'm asking you this morning, out of this text, do you believe this? Do you believe this gospel? Then pray tell me why you will not repent and publicly confess him and be baptized by immersion. Because a belief that is not followed by obedience is not a belief. It's a false belief. It's a pseudo-belief. Because if you really believe, you'd stand before the whole world and say, I am with Christ. I've been buried in the waters of baptism. I've been resurrected out of these waters. And I'm a part of the family of God. And I want the whole world to know it. I want all my family to come to see me baptized in these waters. Because Christ has given me life. Amen. That's what believers do. And you know what they do? They fall in love with Christ and they fall in love with his church and they spend the rest of their life serving him in their local church until he comes. And when he comes, he gathers his church unto himself. <coughs> the blessed text, the good news for the sinner who is joyless, sick, impotent, destitute, mortal, blind, and dead. Jesus Christ is the vine, the great shepherd, the door, the bread, the way, the light, and the resurrection. Every implication of the sinner's condition is answered in the great I am. Do you believe this? If you repent of your sin and seek direction for baptism and church membership, that's the path. How can I confess my faith publicly is the response of the believer. And then I close. Dear Christian, do you believe this? If you believed it in the past, can it be said that you're still believing. You see here in this text. In the last verse. Verse 27. She says to him. Yes Lord. And it would read this way. I have believed. Because it's a perfect tense verb. There's a point back here. When she believed. And that believing is continuing on. I believed. And I'm still in the state of believing. Not this old SBC nonsense back in the day. Oh, I got saved when I was seven. I wrote it in my Bible. And that happened back there. And I got the t-shirt. And I went on with my life. That's not salvation. I believe. And I'm still believing. And I'm going to believe all the way until I see Jesus face to face. And then I shall know. Yeah. That's biblical salvation. I believed. I'm believing. And one day I will see him face to face. And I would encourage you and challenge you. Would you make these glorious truths known to your children, to your grandchildren, to your neighbor, to your co-worker? Would you take a moment, it takes about two and a half minutes, take a moment and say, can I tell you something? They said, yeah, you can tell me something. I want to tell you that sinners are biblically joyless. They're sick. I want to tell you that they're impotent and they're destitute. I want you to know they're mortal and won't live forever. I want you to know they're blind. And I want you to know they're dead in their sins. And I want you to know that unless you repent and believe in Christ, you're going to die in your sins and end up in hell. Why don't you tell somebody that? Why would you tell them that? In order that they can have an opportunity to see the beauty and the glory of Christ. Dr. Roy Fish was not a Calvinistic man, but he was a dear man of God. And I loved him dearly. Passionate man. I go out the streets and witness with that guy in there with that guy was a soul winning machine. But he told me this. He said, A lot of people don't share the gospel and do these types of things because they're afraid they'll offend somebody. He said, Exactly where are they going to offend them to? Hell number two? <laughs> they're already on their way to hell and we're worried about offending somebody. It doesn't make any sense. They're on their way to hell, and we're worried about upsetting somebody. Maybe we could share with them, and their destination could be altered. Yeah. 
all for a church that will continue to press the gospel because we care for souls. Would Jeff, you come?